Hi everybody, my name is David Hood and I help give pastoral leadership at Southeast City Church and I just wanted to take a moment to share with you why I love Jesus. Um, I could get you to believe in Jesus or try to get you to believe in Jesus by making all kinds of arguments for the historicity of his resurrection or the veracity and truthfulness of the New Testament documents, but really at the end of the day, what dry, draws me to Jesus and I think would draw you to Jesus as well is his heart. And his heart comes through really clearly in a story that he tells in Luke 18. He also, Jesus, told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple complex to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee took his stand and was praying like this, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, turn your wrath from me, a sinner. I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Four reasons why I love Jesus and his heart from this text. Number one, grace. Jesus puts before us two different people in this story. You've got the Pharisee, who's the religious leader. To bring it into modern terms, he's the guy who shows up at church every week early. He's got a three-piece suit, a giant leather-bound King James Bible. His wife looks all perfect and put together. His children are totally obedient. He's a stickler for the rules. He thinks he's better than everybody, and everybody thinks that he's better than them. You've got the religious leader, and then you've got the tax collector. Uh, in Jesus' day, tax collectors exploited their own people for their benefit. They were greedy, and they worked for the oppressors, the colonizers, and they lived immoral lives. To bring it into modern terms, you've got the religious leader and you've got an addict, an adulterer, a philanderer, somebody who uses and abuses people. You've got someone who, in our eyes, is broken and unworthy and someone in our eyes who's put together and perfect. And Jesus says both of these guys go up to the temple to pray. The religious leader has a lot to boast about. The tax collector, the broken person, has nothing to boast about. He's got nothing. All he can do is throw himself on the mercy of God and hope that God is merciful and good. Jesus asks which of these two people went home justified, which of them went home made right with God that day. And incredibly, it's not the person we would choose. It's the person we would never in a million years choose that goes home forgiven and right with God because he threw himself on the mercy of God. Jesus says in this story that he didn't come. He's not interested in rewarding those that are religiously zealous and perfect and morally upright and put together. He's interested in giving unmerited favor and blessing to those that recognize their brokenness, humble themselves, and ask for mercy. Jesus is gracious. Here's the thing, though. The religious leader, he wasn't as good as he thought he was. When you read this story, you realize he's arrogant and self-righteous and boastful. Jesus was once asked, what is the, the main commandment, the, the, the greatest law? And he says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says that's what the whole law comes down to, love God and love people. And the religious leader, even though he's keeping the minutia of the law, even though he's a stickler for all the rules, he's not keeping its heart, its essence, its spirit. He doesn't love God, he loves himself. And he doesn't love his neighbor, he looks down on his neighbor with contempt in this story. So the religious leader is just as in need of mercy as the tax collector. He needs it too. And this is what Jesus is teaching us. We all need mercy. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. That is, none of us are living the way that we're supposed to. None of us love God and our neighbor the way that we should. And we hurt ourselves and we hurt others and we hurt the creation and we offend God and we deserve to be judged for these things. 
We need mercy. And the amazing thing about this story is that Jesus is the answer to the tax collector's plea for mercy. Jesus came into the world, the Son of God took on human flesh. He came into the world to live the life that we should have lived. He came to show us what it means to be fully human and to live a life that's centered around loving God and loving others. And then he died the death that we should have died. He took the judgment that we deserve in our place on the cross so that we could be delivered and rescued from it. And then he resurrected from the dead three days later, overcoming every barrier between us and God. And in Jesus, there is forgiveness for all of our sins. There's reunion with God. There's entrance into his unwavering, unfailing, everlasting love. There's life forever with God. There's new life in the here and now, a new identity identity, new purpose, new destiny, all of these things are ours in Jesus. He's won them for us. And we don't have to do anything to earn these things. These things are freely given to us, even though we're undeserving, if we entrust ourselves to Jesus. It's grace. It's grace. That's the first thing I love about Jesus, his grace. The second thing I love about Jesus in this story is freedom. Because Jesus has done everything necessary for me to be made right with God, I don't have to live a life of anxious, fearful striving to be enough, to be better, to measure up, to be accepted, to belong. I don't have to do that. I already belong. I'm already accepted. I'm already loved. I don't have to work for these things. In other words, I have freedom to be broken. I have freedom to fail and mess up. Now, does that mean that my failures and my sins don't matter? No, of course they do, but here's the difference. If I have to earn God's love, then my failures are devastating and catastrophic. But if I know that I'm already loved by God, when I fail, I know I can run into his arms and receive forgiveness and grace and help to do better. If I feel like God's love has to be earned when I mess up, I, I have to justify it somehow or explain it away or shift the blame to somebody else or pretend like it didn't happen or make up for it, right? Because I've got to do it. I've got to earn my way to heaven. But if I know that I'm already loved by God when I fail, I can own that failure. I can own that sin. I can turn away from it. I can receive grace. I can learn from it. I can grow. I can move forward and I can do better, but do better not to be loved, but do better because I'm already loved and I want to please God. The tax collector gets to go home secure in the love of God because it was won for him by Jesus. It's not based on his performance, whereas the religious leader goes home anxious. He did well that day, but tomorrow's a new day, and if he blows it, he's vulnerable. His, his life is full of fear, but if we have Jesus, our life, we can be secure, safe, good. The third thing that I love about Jesus from this story is love. He enables me, empowers me to love. If you feel like you have to earn God's love, then you never truly love God. You fear him and you're trying to measure up. But if I know that God already loves me, I can love him. If I'm trying to earn God's love, then I just see other people as a means to an end. They're either an object, or sorry, an obstacle to me getting to God, or they're a vehicle to me getting to God. They're either a threat to me, or they're somebody that I can look down on with, with shame and, and contempt. But if I know that God already loves me, then I can freely love other people. And I can love even unlovable people because I was unlovable and God loved me. I was undeserving and God loved me. I'm free from having to determine whether somebody is worthy of my love or not and I can love all people. And then the last thing that I love about Jesus in this story, generosity. The tax collector asked Jesus for mercy or asked God for mercy, but what he got was so much more. And that's been true of Jesus. Jesus hasn't just 
rescued me from, from judgment, rescued me from hell. He's given me so much more. He's with me every day of my life. He walks with me. He talks with me. He helps me to become like him, to, to live the best life that I possibly can. He helps me to love God and love people. He heals me from my traumas. He liberates me from the false narratives that I've been living under as a result of those traumas. He, he breaks sinful and hurtful habits in my life and addictions. He comforts me. He redeems my suffering. He makes it mean something. He speaks truth into my life. He reassures me of what's real and what's true. He shows me a million kindnesses and is endlessly patient. And he gives me a hope that can endure anything. Because someday, even if I die, he's going to resurrect my body from the dead. And he's going to resurrect this whole earth. He's going to make everything sad come untrue. He's going to vanquish all evil and darkness and pain and death. And he's going to make all things new. And he's going to rule over a kingdom of righteousness and peace and joy and love and justice for forever and ever and ever. And I'll get to live there with him. And so no matter what disruptions or upheavals or chaos or darkness there is in my life that I have to face, I can know that everything is going to be ultimately okay because of Jesus. This is why I love Jesus. And this is why I believe he is worthy of our whole lives, our whole hearts, our whole devotion. And it's worth it for you to entrust yourself to him and follow him and love him and be loved by him. Thank you so much.